infrastructure is crumbling and the problems are only getting worse. The pressure to find solutions is hot. Let's talk about why American cities have no water, no electricity, and no money to fix their infrastructure problems. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast, hosted by Chad Smelter. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. My name is Chad Smelter, the CEO and founder of BigTurmit.com. With us today is our guest, Mike Simpson from Emmy Simpson Company. He's the CEO, and uh, he is making a big difference in the water and wastewater industry. Thank you for joining us there, Mike. Thank you, Chad. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, look forward to chatting about uh, infrastructure and the water and sewer industry and what's happening and what's, uh, what the hot topics are. Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll be- so it's, uh, it's, it, it's going to be an exciting day. It is. It's super exciting because I love the history of Emmy Simpson. All right. I went through and looked at your website, looked at the history, and, and, and it looks like your was it your grandpa, your dad? Like who started the industry? Who started the Emmy Simpson? Uh, it, 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 Emmy Simpson's company started 43 years ago, okay. and it was started by my father. Awesome. Uh, my father started in the in the in the water uh, water business as a pipe salesman back in 1956, and uh, uh, he worked for numerous uh, numerous entities uh, in in pipe and water meters. And uh, uh, his last, I call it last gig, when he was working for someone, he was the general manager of AirVac, the vacu- vacuum sewage uh, business down in Rochester, Indiana, where I, uh, where I grew up and graduated high school from. And uh, in 1979, uh, he decided he wanted to form his own business, and he uh, started M.E. Simpson Company. Uh, and he was a manufacturer's rep and, uh, uh, it started really going. And so in 1983, he convinced me that since I was, I had only been, I had been in school for a couple of years, didn't like it and was going from job to job, trying to figure out what to do with my life as a 23 year old. And he, uh, he and my mother convinced me that I'd be good at this. And, uh, uh, we, we, I started, uh, started with him, uh, in 80, February of 83. And then uh, a couple of years later, my uh, brother-in-law, Dan was just finishing at Purdue and he, uh, he joined the company and we decided to provide the services ourselves instead of just being a rep company. Uh, most of it had to do with, I know this will shock you control. Uh, we, 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 sell a job. And as I always said, sell a job and they do something dumb. And I got yelled at. Right. And, uh, and, uh, by the customer, because I was the point of contact and we decided that we, if we did it ourselves, then we knew who did it and had control over those people. That was our running joke. And so my brother-in-law and I, uh, you know, there was the three of us and off to the races we went. That's and, awesome. You know, here we are today in 2022 with uh, close to 80 employees and multiple offices uh, across the uh, or from the eastern part of the country. And we're just big into all kinds of things in the water and sewer business uh, in services for for utilities. So, yeah, no, that's an amazing story. Like the history of the family and next generations taking it over. Uh, you know, that, that is amazing. Do you have a, do you have a predecessor to you coming up in the future? Just curious. Uh, talking to, uh, got, uh, got, uh, a couple of niece and a nephew that are the right age group. Uh, my niece is, uh, works, uh, for NICOR over in Illinois. She's a PE. Uh, my nephew, uh, works over in LaPorte in a logistical warehouse for Harper Collins, uh, Trying to see if they're convincing them that this kind of crazy lifestyle is uh, uh, is something for them. So we're 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 working on that succession plan to see if we can move it to generation next. Now, when you say crazy lifestyle, let's dig into that a little bit more because I'm in that space, you're in that space, and I'd love to know your interpretation of that. Uh, like, well, it's it's uh, 
you know, I, I always chuckle when I watch TV and listen. I always equate it to listening to politicians pontificate uh, about this, that, and the other thing. And, and uh, people don't have a clear understanding what entrepreneurship really is and what owning a business really is. And it may look all... Uh, all really cool from the outside, but uh, there's uh, there's a lot of stress and uh, a lot of uh, uh, I'm going to say joys and tears all at the same time. Oh, yeah. And as I say, you know, I've I've had my share of uh, laying awake at night wondering if there's enough money in the checkbook to cover payroll. Yeah, uh, we've been down all those roads, and it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, it can be a very, very stressful, stressful lifestyle. So, uh, yeah. some people see it, it doesn't interest them. And I respect that. And others of us are such as yourself. And I know myself are mentally unstable <laughs> and thus uh, crazy that. enough to do this, it's, you know, and yeah. don't think anything of it because not you know, as I always laugh, I'm really not right in the head. And that's what, you know, causes issues. Yeah, so yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm with you 100%. It's, it's amazing that, uh, it, well, like they say, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? It's, it's, it's just, the oh, yeah, it is. It's like, oh, we want to make all this money. But, you know, go ahead, take the risk, start your company, leave your company where you're making lots of money. And it's, yeah. It's, oh, it's, yeah. It's, uh, you know, and and lots of money is a relative term because <laughs> it's not what yeah, it doesn't exactly work that way. It sounds good though on paper. Yeah. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. What everybody yeah. thinks so. Yeah. All right, in your in your experience, all right, let's take it from the eighties, nineties, two thousands. What what trends have you seen the industry move into from from back then to the well. It, you know, since since I started 39 years ago, I mean, the trend has really been, I'll use, it, it's technology, and I call it computerization. I'm sure there's much fancier terms, yeah. but that's the trend I've watched in the industry and, and, you know, where we are today. I mean, I look even even for our company, you know, we've gone from everything on a printed form and a pencil and a clipboard to everything's on a tablet or for, as I laugh, for our younger technicians with fantastic eyesight, they can they can do it on a cell phone. Right. I can't see that well. Even a tablet has to be zoomed in. So, uh, and I chuckle about that, but we've gone, it's the technology change and the, the, technology in in some of our spaces like in the water loss space in the leak detection area you know in 77 the first real correlator was created and pat patented for leak detection and today this generation here we are in 2022 you know coming up on uh, uh 50 years later yeah. the the base is still there of the original algorithms and invention, but they've now improved everything and the algorithms and, and it's been technology. So technology is driving. And now with, you know, the newest and latest technology that uh, we, we promote that we use ElectroScan uh, is really just kind of blowing the doors off of the leakage world, both in water and sewer. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's the thing I see is is technology uh, right. is really changing the entire dynamic yeah. of the industry. Hundred percent with you. But yeah, and then I tell people though that, that this is a long term career path and a place where you can make a solid, decent living. Uh, be it working for a utility or a private business like ours, uh, because no matter how much technology we have, uh, until they invent the robot that can do it, it takes people. It I, still has a human component. You need people to run the equipment, to do the work. It's, you know, I don't think we're quite at the 
you know, the, the clone stage as I was watching the Star Wars uh, marathon over the Labor Day weekend. Right. We're not quite at that stage where the robots will do all the stuff for right, us yet. Right. So, yeah, that's, so, yeah, it could be, fun. you know, who knows down the road, that's for sure. Oh, sure. I'm sure things will change. Automation is always changing, but I believe in our business, just like uh, and most infrastructure things, even when you talk roads, bridges, sidewalks, uh, you know, everything, uh, you know, that group, you still need people. Yeah. You, you can't, there's, there's cool machinery, does a lot of cool things, still requires a person. Yeah, let's talk about, Still requires a person. Let's talk about people because we are in this phase right now where we have this gap of skilled labor, right? Coming into the construction space uh, more particularly. And I would assume that you're kind of dealing with the impacts of, of labor shortages, just like everybody else. Can you elaborate on that? A same, bit? same, same problems. We've got, uh, we've got a couple unfilled positions open in Indianapolis. So any of the listeners, when they hear this podcast, do you live in the Indianapolis area, go to our website Love and apply. We're looking for people. Uh, and, and we, even around in, even where our Illinois facilities, our East coast facilities, we're always on the lookout. Uh, there's, you know, cause growth continues and it is, it has been difficult with so many people deciding to leave the workforce or, you know, whatever, hopefully they're, they, they, it appears people are starting to come back. They're, yeah. they're starting to re-engage and that's a good thing. And that's when I say, this is the, you know, uh, I was just reading an article this morning talking about a, uh, uh, out in the New York, I think it was the New York it's East coast area. And it's a, uh, uh, a steel erector contractor and they're offering, uh, a uh, high school degree, uh, 18 year old, uh, $47 an hour. Wow. And wow. it's, uh, now I don't, I think that's the end after you complete their wow. apprentice program, but it looked very interesting. And that's what I say about our business is this is a, you know, with our training programs, you know, you're, you, you may start at $21 an hour. Uh, but I guarantee you within 12 months, that's it. That's more, that's $23 an hour. And within 24 months, uh, to 36 months, somewhere in that time frame, if you complete all the training tasks, yeah. it's $25 an hour job with full benefits with all the bells and whistles okay. and dental and all the other stuff that goes with it as i call it yeah the stuff you and most it, people don't think it, about. it's a, it's a real job and a career that you know no different than our friends that work at the mill you know because we live in northwest indiana and other places the wages are competitive with that nice you know we try to be relatively competitive and you know, try to offer maybe not exactly the same as fancy of benefits because we're small, right. but we certainly do our best. But I tell people that, you know, you don't have to go to college to work here. We have plenty of college graduates that work here, but you don't have to go to college yep. to work here. That's a misnomer. Yeah. This is just like, you know, I'm sure you talk to a lot of people, chat around, and there are a lot of places out there in in the trades and everywhere else that are saying hey need you to graduate from the local high school i'll take it from there thanks you know yeah just yeah we need graduate from yeah we need graduate that. from high school come see me yeah, you know we need labor workforce and that's one thing uh one of my business development managers you, you met landon he's right telling you just go to high schools and start recruiting just like the military kind of does it, it's just get there get their attention because Look, I get it. Education. We need the next education and you do sometimes need college degrees, but learning in the field, I've had these conversations with a lot of people. It's like, you know, when the engineers go to get engineering degrees, they really don't have a lot of field experience. And then they come out, they're an engineer, they do book work, they're going through the book and then they send it out to the field and the field guys are like, what is this? You know? That kind yeah. of stuff. It's like, wait, uh, it doesn't and, make any sense. <laughs> so. yeah. And and that's that's the interesting thing. And and of course, you know, again, 
if you're if you're predisposed and want, and I highly recommend engineering as a first class education and a place to go. Yeah. But I'm also if you're not in the, if you're not that much into college and you don't want to spend even at Purdue's prices of twenty five grand a year, yeah. uh, you don't want to spend a hundred grand for four years. You know, you, you can you can you can start in a career you know, with us and in four years time, probably be making 70,000 plus dollars to, you know, heading toward a hundred thousand dollars a year yourself. Right. You know, you don't have to, there's no, that's, that's the misnomer. And that's what, you know, I talked to a lot of guys in the construction industry, the building trades, operating engineers, and they all say the same thing. Hey, you know, you come to work for us, you get through the training programs, you actually work hard and make an effort, you get paid to learn, and in the end, it won't be hard to make $30 an hour and, you know, and, and have benefits and, you know, with overtime and all that other stuff, those numbers just escalate yeah, up. Right. You know, yeah. they just escalate up, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and it's, those are real quality jobs, you know, yeah. that's a, a real job. So you know? kind of going into, obviously we have a labor shortage right now. We have, uh, you know, a lot of procurement opportunities out there. We have a lot of infrastructure funds coming in from the federal side of things. Uh, how uh, have you as a CEO decided to move your company in the direction to kind of, uh, you know, labor shortages. How do you keep your business growing? Is, is basically what I'm trying to get to with that. Well, as in, we just continue to work hard. Like you said, we continue to work hard at recruiting. I'm trying to find new angles of attack, talking to the local high schools, talking to, uh, trying to get in on the ground floor, nice. just like you've talked about. Uh, you know, with with infrastructure is. A high priority for most people across the board and be it water or sewer roads and bridges uh, you can new buildings new houses you can list the you can list them all out yeah. and so there's oodles of opportunity so yes it's it's now it's recruitment uh you know and and then getting people that will help you you know move forward and like I say, we're we're using trying to use every trick in, in our book and right. and talk to everybody we can talk to. Yeah. You know, about opportunity. Yeah, I think it's a great place as you as a CEO, you know, one of the things I respect about you is you're um, you've been in the industry a long time. You've been running ME Simpson for a long time. You as a CEO I see has a you have adapted to you know, bringing in the millennials and stuff like that and, and being an open place where you can learn a lot about the infrastructure world and get into this business, which is amazing to your benefit. Great job. Um, Thanks. Sticking to infrastructure, though, and, and tech, going a little bit back to technology, what are some of the other problems you've been finding in this space where we all compete with technology and infrastructure? Uh, I think it's – I think the the only – not it, well. The problem that I see is, in some cases, people are entrenched in we've done it this way for the last hundred years, and they're not good. People in general are never good with change, and so the the hard part is getting them to realize why they need to change the true value of change and how it actually is for and to their benefit, not only as a person, but their utility. Uh, use an example. Uh, one of the things we see all the time in the water loss area is people don't test their production meters or they tell me they test them and what they're doing is the 4 to 20 milliamp signal test from the head of the water meter back to the computer to the skateboard mm -hmm. and 
they're making sure that that's operating properly so that the signal's correct, so the reading's correct. Yeah. And that's a valuable, valuable part of the test. Unfortunately, it has nothing to do with the physical water meter. And so they're not testing the physical water meter. There's testing the signal from the head to the computer. Wow. The physical water meter, you need to do a physical test on to verify that it is functioning properly okay. and accurately. Wow. And so that's been a, and, and the problem is, is people adapted to that and got used to that over the last, I'm going to say, 50 plus years, probably 100. Wow. And they just look at you all confused well, we've always done it this way. Yeah. And it's 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 nobody's fault. It's just a habit that got started in places and slowly but surely we have been re educating and making changes and helping utilities move forward. Let's let's talk about that meter real quick, because that's data that uh, you know, is estimated mostly, right? Is that is that the case? And I'm still learning some more about the water meters and things like that. Uh, water meters, no water meters. It's it's not estimated. Water meters are are, are measuring or counting the amount of gallons flowing by, right. and and so you know the thing is with a with a you know we have we have mechanical meters that are kind of the backbone and would have been there forever. Now you're hearing a lot about solid state meters. They're the ones with no moving parts in it. Okay. Uh, you'll hear a term mag meter. That's right. a particular brand style. There's numerous solid state type meters uh, that use ultrasonic technology, magnetic technology. They use several different technologies. Yeah. So there's no, there's no moving parts, but it's still measuring the flow of water yeah. and what what we're professing to people especially on the mechanical side the mechanical style but on all styles is that annual regular testing of these meters these large meters at your production facilities at your wells whatever it is yeah. you want to know what you're introducing into the system that helps you with your water loss components your water audit so you know what you introduced yeah. and then you've got something to measure against because if that information is inaccurate everything down the road is inaccurate it's meaningless and it's the same too you want to measure it because in your production thing you're measuring so you know how many how much quote chemicals to feed in when you're treating the water, you want to measure it so you do it correctly, so you have the right balance uh, to treat the water, so it's safe to drink clean, and you know, and that goes to chlorine just as well because that's the back the agent we use against bacteria, right. and I need to be able to measure. Right. I need it to be accurate because we need it correct. So that's one of the biggest reasons for for testing is just in a big case it's verification hey it is working right thumbs up we're moving forward yeah. good job yeah. you know but when it's not right then we need to cal fix it calibrate it adjust it and get it back to where it's correct so we know what we're doing so sticking to that um uh, it sounds like these mechanical meters and i'm still learning about meters obviously i'm don't yeah. know what I'm doing, no, right. obviously this is great uh, the mechanical meters sound like there's, is there still a lot of mechanical meters out there? Vast majority. Yes. Vast majority. That sounds like so you're problem, talking right? about part that sounds like a big problem. No, most of those meters are very accurate and work fine. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No, I mean it, it, it age is a component. No question. Uh, water quality is a component that has an effect on wear on an inside of a meter. But most meters, your house meter, you know, at commercial complexes, big industry, most are still mechanical. Okay. People are starting to change to solid state. Yeah. That's happened in the last, starting to happen more in the last 10 years. Okay. So that's why I say the vast majority of meters out there, whether it's at your house, uh, whatever, or what's considered a mechanical meter, 
that just means it has moving parts on the inside that's measuring the flow of water and sending that count to the meter head and and then that meter's red yeah. you know so a lot of reports obviously there's you know a lot of water main breaks a lot of leak right in the system right and so how is emmy simpson looking at obviously with electroscan and some other technology how is uh, emmy simpson looking at solutions to those problems that are out there well we're 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 in the middle of a couple of pilot studies uh deploying uh uh listening i call them listening devices but nodes uh that will go on valves and go on fire hydrants that listen 24 hours a day and that's kind of a proactive approach to leak detection because the goal is you'll never stop main breaks main breaks will occur you know leaks are a living breathing animal as i say they're always going to happen but we're now out there promoting putting these systems out and monitoring them every day and i'm looking for that leak that starts that i can proactively fix before it breaks it's not as much it's it's about saving water and saving money because it's just wasted production money uh, when it spills on the ground and nobody's paying for right. it. But at the same time, it also, you've seen it, you've seen the pictures, infrastructure, I'll use Valpo, you know, you get a big rain break in the middle of downtown Valpo on Lincoln Way, you flood a couple basements, You it causes hundreds of thousands of dollars of property damage that's what you're trying to avoid so if that leak starts small and we know about it today you can fix it tomorrow before it continues because leaks grow you know just over time and the pipe you know the pipe flexes because the ground moves and it's just a combination of all those little things and age does sometimes have a factor and that's what causes you've seen the the stuff in Dixmore, Illinois, where they're having so many problems. And it's it's just it's it's yes, it's very old pipe. And slowly but surely they're gonna have to work on replacing that pipe. You know, it's there's no magic wand or brush that's going to for any water system, no, no matter whom you are, it is but it's also talks about how we've in, ignored investment uh, over time. Uh, right now, you're, everybody, I'm sure, is reading, seeing, they're talking about Jackson, Mississippi. Right. And it really wasn't a flood that caused Jackson's woes. It made it worse, didn't help. Yeah, it just made it worse. But, right. but, but Jackson, Mississippi, sadly, that water system has been neglected for decades. And I'm going to go out on a limb and they won't hire me, you know, because I say it, but it's been run poorly. Sorry. You know, you can call me, you can write me letters and (laughs) say I'm mean, but it's been run poorly and they have not invested in the system and what they have invested obviously hasn't been good investments. The best I can tell. $61 million budget. Yeah. And, and, and so it's, it's that's that's a problem and this is jackson is just a a a, it's a microcosm of a much larger problem nationwide they're just making press right now and it's sad i feel terrible for all those residents i don't want them to drink bad water i don't want i think they deserve to have quality water at their fingertips at their tap no questions asked. I'm on, I'm really on their side. It's, it's just sadly they're in the state that they're in, right. you know, but that shows, you know, that shows you the problems that are around the country, Yeah. you know, and, and they exist and they're real and it, you, you don't have to be Jackson where, you know, they may be more economically disadvantaged. It can be in affluent areas too. Don't ever assume 
the affluent areas might be luckier because they've got more money to throw at right. it, but everybody has the same problem. Everybody's that got smoking gun for real. To go off. <laughs> That's for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got the same issue. Yeah. No doubt. You know, and it has to be dealt with. And it's aged infrastructure that we've left. We've all left sit too long. Yep. You know, and and. Not that the pipes aren't good, even at 100 years old. I've I've seen some stuff at our East Coast operations in Wilmington, Delaware, yeah. that you know is probably close to 150 years old. Uh, cast iron pipe that's got to be this thick, and yeah. I've seen it looks perfectly fine. Yeah. So there's not a big incentive to want to get rid of it. I wouldn't. That'd be a waste of money. But they also, you can ask the guys at Wilmington. And it's a good, good client of ours, and they'll they're they're pounding away at pipe replacement in areas of town. They have a list. They are working it every day. Every. Are we working it more on historic? You know, you kind of mentioned the pipe is 150 years old. Are they doing triage of this system first? They're doing they're doing triage in advance. They're doing studies. Nice. That's some of the stuff programs we offer with our pipe rank AI services, as well as our ePulse, which is an actual boots on the ground checking segments of pipe program. We're, we're helping. They have their engineering team, service teams that are out there. So they're trying to be strategic in their replacement. And, and it's, you know, using history and knowledge and, yeah. you know, trying to be you know, as methodical as possible because everybody's aware, you know, replacing 5,280 feet of pipe, a mile of pipe is going to cost you probably, it's got to be, depending on where you're at, at least a million and a half a mile. And so, I mean, it adds up real fast. And when you have... 200 or 2,000 miles of pipe, that's math, and it comes fast, you know, and there's a lot more to it than people realize. It's just not an easy button to go replace that pipe, and uh, it takes work. A lot of planning Uh, takes place, and a lot of... A lot of planning, a lot of organization, and, but there are proactive, like our client in Wilmington, Delaware very proactive they're on top of it and there's lots around here in the chicago metro uh northwest indiana everybody is i'm watching a lot of pragmatic proactive city of chicago you know we work with them their engineering group boy they're on top of it they're one of the better ones i see out there it's just it's hard you know they've got a big system and it's just right you know yeah it's it's not an easy button it's it's going to take time and and right now they're probably their emergency biggest focus deals with all the lead service lines yeah and that's another that (laughs) is uh you know is again another me simpson company service we have using electroscan technology i can help you find the unknown services and tell you what the material is. Uh, you know, it's for the stuff that you don't have records for. It's, it's a very specific thing, but you know, I, I know the audience, everyone is aware by October 15th or 16th of 2024, you must have turned into the EPA, your, uh, your, pl- your, 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 your mitigation plan, but most importantly, you have to turn in your inventory. And if you have 12,000 services, you have to tell them exactly what all 12,000 services are. And that's, that's hard and fast. And now I think that date's going to have to slip because simply I don't think people can go fast enough because I think it's by I don't know the date in 2027, but if you read the EPA rules and regulations, all lead has to be out of the ground by 2027. I think that's right. I might be reading that wrong. I'm going to have to go look it up again. I'm going. 
Sure. I'm going. I'm going from memory. <laughs> uh, I've read so many things, right. and it all goes. That's why in the infrastructure bill, there was 15 million, 15 million, 15 billion dollars set aside specifically for lit, lead mitigation in drinking water systems. Right. Basically, three billion dollars per year for the next five years. Wow. And in the congressman I've spoken with from Indiana, I've told all of them, get prepared for that to slip. And I said, guys, I think you're going to need a little more money. I think the number's not right. Yeah. It's no offense. I mean, everybody's doing their best estimate. I'm not criticizing. But I said, based on our manpower struggles, I don't think we can get it done oh in a five in a five year time frame. I It's going to be really really hard yeah. and not because nobody doesn't want to it's because we can't we don't you know yeah. we don't, i don't yeah. think i don't think there's enough resources out yeah. there it'll be interesting but it's uh you know in all the utilities we're speaking with that we do business with obviously you know just getting the inventory done so they can present their mitigation plans just getting the inventory done is a task yeah. And, and I, like I say, we're finding that most utilities are finding that in their records, 10 to even up to 20% on some, they have no records. They don't know what's underground. Wow. And hey, you, you got to remember some of this stuff was put in a hundred years ago yeah. and even 50 years ago, you know, but think think most development if you think about where we live in northwest indiana and the greater metropolitan area most stuff the heavy building was in 45 to now but the he you, so you you're going back all the way to 1950s when all these suburbs blew up yeah. and everything was installed yeah. so i'm not surprised that they're missing pieces you know, you know stuff happens that yeah that's a long time ago yeah. you know they did not have the advent today of computers right. and databases and all the <laughs> other stuff so was... you know i'm not i'm not i'm not pointing a, a a finger at somebody going what do you mean you can't tell me what these are because that that it's a foolish finger to point it's a realism that you know I bet I can't, I bet I, we had, you know, I'm sure there are missing records from 1979 when we started this business that I probably can't find anymore. Who knows if they've been, probably were destroyed or tossed out because nobody thought about it, yeah. you know, kind of a, that kind of stuff. Interesting but, segue into what you're kind of getting to is data, right? Infrastructure data. And I feel like, in my opinion, that there's we need a centralized database for infrastructure to help communities understand what they actually have and how to budget appropriately. Well, what do you think? Yeah, nowadays, nowadays, I mean, Indiana, yep. specifically Indiana, requires an asset management plan uh, that has to be turned in. It's got to be a five-year plan. It's got to be records more most utilities and it continues to grow every day are are coming to life with data management systems mm -hmm. uh gis systems they're they're digitizing their records uh they're actually doing better than you think i don't yeah. know that you need a a central repository okay. but yes most most utilities need to have a robust data management program for their water and sewer, right. you know, and, and quite frankly, y you can add in roads, right. sidewalks, trees in the park stuff. I've, I've got utilities. I know that the city's GIS program, they even have the trees yeah. documented and, GPS because uh, the parks department has the swing set and the teeter totter. Yeah. Uh, now I, everybody chuckles, but I'm Ooh. like, but you got to doc, you have to document all of that. Yeah. You should have a running inventory of all your stuff.
stuff. I just call it stuff. <laughs> and no different than your house when you're in the basement and you're pulling those plastic totes out and you open it up and it's a surprise and you're like, wow. <laughs> so you know, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Look at this is from this is from nineteen eighty three. My wife did that yeah. to me the other day That's and she right. said, Get rid of this. And I'm like, <laughs> But these are treasures and she goes, It's junk. <laughs> you know, uh yeah. but 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 it goes to that is there's no question that that we have to be and with today's technology is an advantage. Mm -hmm. We have to be super more aggressive about these inventories and about managing our data and managing our databases. Yeah. And utilities really are stepping up to this and this, you know, hey, it, that's, that's what Flint, Michigan did, sadly, tragically. It woke everybody up to some very interesting and concerning problems yeah, and what we're seeing in jackson mississippi is another example right. of so far nobody's gotten sick and nobody has had anything bad happen so far yeah. scares me to death that somebody could but that's the problem with flint we were ending up we were poisoning not now poisoning is a mean word, but lead was leaching into the system yeah. and little children were drinking that water. How about that for an answer? Yeah. And so, yes, in simple terms, in mean terms, we were poisoning little children right. and it was wrong right. and it was a failure. That was a hardcore failure of humans. Yeah. Hardcore. Yeah. And what we're seeing in Jackson is a hardcore failure of humans. And the fact that they even yep. knew that was a major, major problem and still didn't fix it is, is amazing to me. Again, that's when I say we get into the words hardcore failure of human yeah. beings. No, you can buy all the technology in the world and all the whiz-bang toys still takes humans. 100%. And what we're seeing when we see these things the failure is always comes back to, they don't want to admit it, but it's human failure yeah. and we screwed up and yeah. instead of owning it, they deflect and blame someone. I forward, you yeah. know, I've read all the articles we were, we were, it was, this is great prep for the conversation because that's the conversation I was having with one of our engineers before I jumped on with you. Yeah. We were talking about Jackson in the, failure of of yep. stupid human tricks 100%. as i call yeah, them. yeah i'm sure yeah. we can talk about a lot of like what involves humans and their their uh decision making and yep. what involves all yeah. that that's a whole nother conversation right. but all right so we got another minute uh we'll wrap it up but um tell us uh you know how to get a hold of emmy simpson and how well, we, you, guys you can him. you can very simply, you know, you can go to emmysimpson.com, look at our website. It'll tell you all the different water and wastewater services we offer for utilities. Our services are all designed around building programs for you to teach you how to do it or turn key. You can call me at 800-255-1521. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, uh, or or uh, just, just email uh, Mike at mesimpson.com. You're going to get a lot of emails. It comes. That's fine. You can email me directly. It's no big deal. Love. I will do my best to answer you quickly and efficiently. But we, we can offer a lot of services and a lot of things to help. And like I say, right now, the big one is we have the technology to help identify those unknown services. But obviously, the standard leak detection for water or leak detection for sewer as I say, they're the same thing. Water, it's escaping the pipe on the sewer side. Uh, it's getting in the pipe. So pick a poison. It doesn't matter. But we have the technologies and the abilities to help you with all those problems and your water meters and your valves and hydrants, all that good stuff. Great. So Thank you so much, Mike. This has been great. Thanks. I 100% am going to reach out again. Where we're going to have to have another podcast. I think we have more to talk about in that human 
we've got a we've got a number of things, Chad. We're gonna have to probably sit down and lay out an outline of some of the cool infrastructure things for we should sure, be talking man. about. That's for sure. Well, thank you All so right. much. I appreciate it, Mike. Appreciate your time. You have a great you day. Too. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, have a good Bye-bye. one. See you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. We hope that this show brought you some insight on relevant topics within the infrastructure world. Please join us every two weeks on Tuesday for the next episode. If you're interested in being a guest on this podcast, please set up a 15-minute interview with your host at calendly.com slash chadsmeltzer. 